Well, thank you so much for uh, coming today. I'm Freddy Stolgens. I teach at Washburn University School of Law. And I'm very thankful that you all unwittingly agreed to be guinea pigs for one of my ideas. So what you're getting is fresh off the presses from uh, a chapter that I'm writing in a monograph on investor state arbitration. Um, now, before I start, how many of you have a background or have taken a class in public international law at some point? Um, and how many of you have some familiarity heard of investor state arbitration? A little bit less, okay. Um, well, let me walk through the definitions one bit at a time. What I want to discuss with you today, I've put the roadmap up on the whiteboard, is first, what on earth does Jura novit curia mean, other than that it's an impressive Latin phrase that people throw around a lot. Um, then develop with you what the problem of jura novit curia in the jurisprudence of investor state tribunals is. Um, lay out the foundation of why that is problematic, why an invocation of jura novit curia is a problem in investor state arbitration. Then discuss with you what the virtues of Jura Novit Curia are, and finally reconstruct it in light of what we've discovered together as part of our journey. Um, now, do you use Jura Novit Curia as a matter of Georgian municipal law? What does, in, in the Georgian context, what do you refer to when you say Jura Novit Curia? Obligation to the, of the judge to refer to the law when we decide the dispute. It's not obligation of the parties to refer to the law. So to decide ex officio, like uh, it means that it is uh, the court knows the law and it can make some legal analysis outside of parties' pleadings. That's precisely how the the, the term has also been understood to a large extent in international law, which means that the um, court takes judicial notice of the law and has an obligation to apply it faithfully no matter what the parties have pled. Um, in the context of the International Court of Justice, the fisheries jurisdiction case of 1974 sets out this principle rather beautifully. The question, though, is what is the basis for jura novit curia? The basis that the International Court of Justice itself sets is in, fundamentally, the United Nations Charter, as well as the statute of the court, meaning that as the principal judicial organ of the United Nations, the International Court of Justice has the obligation faithfully to apply the law and has an obligation to take judicial notice of the law, which is an obligation which it cannot abdicate in any way, shape, or form as a matter of treaty law, as a matter of its constitutive documents. Now, what is important about that is that it is not as one might think, and as some have argued, a general principle of law as recognized by civilized nations. Or at least not principally a general principle of law as recognized by civilized nations in the context of the International Court of Justice. But why do I harp on that? If it were a general principle of law as recognized by civilized nations, we would have a larger problem in the context of arbitration because investor state arbitrations are supposed to apply international law if it is part of international law that jura novit curia, we might be stuck in the position that, well, arbitral tribunals, as a matter of applying international law, must apply this principle. The fact that it is conventionally based 
and not premised in a general principle. Therefore, it's really significant to understand what the power of tribunals are and how far one would have to stray into general international law with regard to this principle. Now, there are limits to jura novit curia in public international law that, if you think about it, are comparatively obvious. Um, what do you think could be some of the limits with regard to the knowledge of international law that an international court has to have, that it has an obligation to investigate and an obligation to know by means of judicial notice? Anything that would come to, to mind? Let me ask the question differently. And let me ask a leading question, I guess. Do you think it would be fair to assume that the International Court of Justice knows Georgian law? No. no. Um, so one of the fundamental limitations of Jura Novit Curia in the international context is that it does not apply to municipal law. The Brazilian loans case in 1921 uh, the Permanent Court of International Justice, the predecessor court of the International Court of Justice, flatly stated that is a factual issue of sorts as to which we will need factual engagement with the parties, and as such, um, we cannot take judicial notice of municipal law. Are there other things like municipal law that you would think create significant problems for an international court? Are there other things where you think, well, that's kind of like Georgian law. I cannot expect the International Court of Justice to know this ex officio. I, I see a discussion developing in the middle. So what are our sources of international law? Going back to um, sort of the beginning of treaties, what kind of treaties do we have? International. So we have international legal treaties. Yes? Bilateral treaties. We have bilateral treaties. So and probably that's some things that you expect that not everyone might know in detail. Yeah. If you have a bilateral treaty, a bilateral treaty generally is lex specialis, I don't know why I keep throwing around Latin. It's one of those bad habits of German people and international lawyers. And I happen to be both, so I apologize ahead of time that I throw around a lot of Latin for no good reason. Um, if I do it too much, just throw something. Um, so Lex Specialis is a, a law that applies only to certain countries that derogates from the general law that is in place for everybody. Now, it, if it derogates from the ordinary course, it would be hard to expect someone to know the exception. Anyone who's been a law student and suffered through a law school exam would know that it's not fair to ask about the exception. Ask me about the rule. Um, so what the International Court of Justice has carved out for itself is an exception with regard to lex specialis. It doesn't have to know that. That is an issue that requires a significant amount of factual investigation into what did the parties actually intend when they stated this. Um, the interpretation of Lex Specialis is something that goes slightly differently. Now, there's another form of Lex Specialis, just as there's Lex Specialis in the context of treaties, there is Lex Specialis in the context of custom. Customary international law doesn't have to be general customary international law, as the asylum case in 1951 noted, it, there can be regional custom, in that case between Peru and Colombia, but you know, in the context of investor state arbitration, you might easily say that there's a regional custom between Canada, the United States, and Mexico that was codified in NAFTA. You could also disagree with that, but you could easily say that. You could say that there's regional custom in various free trade areas, maybe the European Union. Um, so depending upon what custom it is that you're invoking, that similarly is a question as to which a court 
would have a hard time to take judicial notice, simply because it is too specific and um, too difficult to state with certainty as a matter of everybody would know this, that we could tell the authority and authenticity of this just by looking at it. Um, so those would tend to be the limits that Jura Novit Curia takes with it, even if we applied it in the context of investor state arbitration. Now, let's look at investor state arbitration. What do investor state arbitral tribunals do? And why am I interested in the subject matter? They're split. The same arbitrator, in different cases, has said, yes, jura novit curia. And in another case, a year later, stated, no, no, no. The arbitral tribunal does not know the law. How could the same person, and he is of more than average intelligence, he's a great scholar, how could a great scholar at the same time affirm and deny a legal proposition that is instrumental to his resolution of the case? Something here has to be fundamentally awry with our understanding of what this jura novit curia is. There is something that we fundamentally do not know on the abstract, rational plane, but that we nevertheless apply as a matter of almost you know, intuitive practice in cases that we know, well, in this case, there's something that looks like jura novit curia that I need to apply. And in this case, that is not the case. So I have to deny that jura novit curia. So there is a significant need to explain on the part of scholarship, guys like myself who practiced for, well, practiced for seven years in the field and oh goodness, probably somewhere around 15 investor state arbitrations in one form or another under my belt. Um, so I would be one of those people who would say, well, of course, you're an Ovid Korea, but no, not you're an Ovid Korea, without thinking that I'm contradicting myself. Um, so what is it about these cases that permits them consistently to say that the principle applies and does not apply? Um, let's start with the obvious shortcomings of jura novit curia in the context of investor state arbitration. So I started off by listing what the limitations are of jura novit curia if it were faithfully applied in the context of investor state arbitration. Namely, lex specialis is one of the main ones. Do you think that most investor state arbitrations affect or rely upon lex specialis as one of the main means to get arbitral redress? Yeah. Well, there are lots of so-called BIT, bilateral investment treaty. Mm -hmm. so, yes. there, the, the codification of quote-unquote investment law, open brackets, to the extent that there is such a thing as a codification of investment law, takes place in the form of a web of bilateral treaties. Um, these bilateral treaties uh, keep growing in number, and you know, in the early 90s, they say, oh, now there are 400. And, then we came to the early 2000s. Now there are more than 1,000. And now we're sort of reaching more than 1,800, more than 2,500. Th depending on whom you ask, the number is ever growing. There are a few multilateral investment treaties that are also relevant. One of them is, uh, I think one that was relevant with regard to Georgia, uh, the Energy Charter Treaty. But that is really the exception. And you have you know, treaties that are really more in the North American sphere, uh, NAFTA, between the United States, Canada, and Mexico, and DR-CAFTA that extends this to Central America and the Dominican Republic. But for the most part, you're looking at highly specialized, regionalized treaties. If that's the case, OK, how you run on with Korea? These are bilateral treaties. So as a first step, we would already have to say, well, maybe they know something because there is 
a form of customary international law that has arisen out of this huge swell of treaties, if that's in fact the case. But very difficult to establish. What else do you have in a lot of bilateral investment treaty disputes? Are they just applying international law? No. What else? Because the, like, the state is one of the parties, and the investment happens in the state. Yeah. And so the state's law, where the investment takes place, is incredibly relevant to figuring out what obligations the state had towards the investor. Both at the jurisdictional stage, did the investor make an investment that is protected under the treaty, or did the investor you know, act in such a manner as to deprive himself of treaty protection? So many treaties state that an investment has to be made in accordance with law. If the investor goes around and bribes a official in the host state in order to get the investment authorization, you don't get treaty protection. But that's an issue in many regards. That's an issue of host state law. We said state doesn't, the, 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 the tribunal couldn't know host state law, couldn't take judicial notice of that. And given that there is an interwebbing between international law and municipal law, and the interwebbing concerns with especialis, there would be a realistic problem to extend Jura Novit Curia all too far. Um, now, this essentially means that, to go back to the ICJ's analogy, you couldn't take judicial notice of a lot of this, which raises a problem that is not just conceptual, but is written into the main convention dealing with the administration of investor state arbitration, the Washington Convention of 1965, uh, also known as the ICSID Convention, which in Article 52 sets out the grounds for annulment uh, of investor state awards. And one of the grounds for annulment is a serious departure from a fundamental rule of procedure. One of the things that they always meant with that was a failure of contradictoire for the civilians or due process for the common lawyers where a party has been denied its right to be heard, the award is subject to annulment. Now, if you take judicial notice of something that you're not supposed to take judicial notice of, you have just denied somebody the right to be heard. Because you have not permitted them to confront the law on the basis of which the decision was made. And in the context of arbitration, there are two annulment proceedings that relevantly address the right to be heard in the context of the application of law. One of them annulled a decision on the basis of an application of municipal law and stated, no, the arbitral tribunal was not sufficiently um, sufficiently well-versed in the municipal law in order to make its finding when there was clear contrary evidence of municipal practice going the other way. It had to consult the parties with regard to that. Another tribunal went as far as saying that even in the context of a pure application of international law, international treaties, a tribunal may not depart from the legal framework set by the parties without denying the parties their due process right. Um, which means that this limitation on judicial notice really has teeth. You do this, you act upon your Novit Korea, arguably you've just committed the big no-no of arbitrators and gotten your award subject to being just tossed out. You have to start again. Um, that also means that we learn something about the powers of arbitral judgment. Remember, we started this whole thing off by saying that the ICJ has the power to know the law because it is the chief judicial organ of the United Nations, that it is not a general principle of law in that context, but that there's a conventional basis for its statement that we know the law. Well, let's reverse this. The 
Washington Convention would suggest the opposite. If you cannot take judicial notice of certain things without running afoul of a due process violation that gives rise to a claim for annulment, that fundamentally must mean that tribunals do not have the power to know the law in certain circumstances. One annulment committee in the early goings noted that a tribunal did not have the power to derogate from the terms of reference that the parties had set. Uh, any, anyone who knows the ICC arbitration rules? Terms of reference, what are those things? Well, they're basically the agreement of the parties. They, they, they resemble the terms upon which parties agree, and the driving arbitration is all about the parties' agreements. Mm -hmm. Probably that is why it was taken of such importance. Mm -hmm. and the, the terms of reference is one of those ICC things that really, I think only the ICC does. It sets out what the scope of the dispute is. It, they are drafted up after the tribunal is constituted with the help of the tribunal. Sometimes the tribunal does it, sometimes the parties do it. And importantly, they are drafted after the parties have had their first shot at explaining what their case is. Which means that if you use terms of reference, you ordinarily describe what the parties have pled their dispute to be. So if you depart from what the parties have said their dispute is, um, you've committed an excess of power. Th there are no terms of reference in investor state arbitration, by the way, unless you have an ICC administered investor state arbitration. The exit convention doesn't have it. Uncitral doesn't have it. So this is a, a metaphor of sorts. Um, now, this is significant, though, um, because, well, consider you're an investor that has an ongoing investment in a country. And there is a measure that you complain about. And you say this was a fair and equitable treatment violation. You do not say it was a take. You do not say it was an expropriation. Why? Well, there's an ongoing relationship that you hope to maintain in the country. If you say it was an expropriation, well, you're pretty much done. They're going to pay you compensation for the value of the, uh, the investment and, you know, finito. You no longer have any more um, ability to act in the state. So you might very well say, no, no, no. Regulations might change. I think that this policy will change at some point. I'm just going to claim for a temporary significant impairment to my investment. I'm not going to say there's been an expropriation. Now, if an arbitral tribunal says, ah, parties, you are very clever. But I disagree with you. This was an expropriation. What the tribunal would have done is it would have taken away the ability of the parties to organize their own dispute and thereby to maintain a relationship past the arbitration in a way that was not intended. So that's why this actually matters. It matters to say that the dispute is other than what the parties played because there could be a very good business reason or a very good policy reason on the side of the government to do it differently. Um, now, a derogation from the legal framework similarly could be a decision with regard to a dispute that was other than the one that was played. So, I, have any of you heard of the big controversy stirring around uh, the interpretive statement concerning Article 1105 of NAFTA? I wouldn't expect you to have heard of it, but it's sort of one of those big problems that's floating about investor state arbitration. What happened in that case was that a tribunal came up with a definition of what uh, 1105 of NAFTA meant, the Fair and Equitable Treatment Protection, and uh, it went far beyond what the parties had played. Both parties have been very conservative in their approach to what Article 1105 meant, and the tribunal ran away with it, which led to the United States, Mexico, and Canada sitting down and saying, no, 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 no. This is really not what we intended. Uh, and to what extent that was pretext, and to what extent that is real. Uh, if you want to read almost like a crime novel about investor state arbitration, Todd Weiler um, has published a book on the interpretation of investment treaties that sets out in minute detail how 
the NAFTA parties nefariously came up with this interpretive statement. But nonetheless, what caused them to do it was that the tribunal had fundamentally done something that the parties had not wanted them to do, precisely because they thought, well, if we overstep, uh, we might well bait the bear. We'd rather not have an interpretive statement. And here we were. So in those instances, the fact that tribunals act beyond what the parties asked them to do has had serious repercussions in actual investor state cases. So to say that the dispute is defined by the legal framework of the parties really means something tangible in the context of investor state arbitration. The last thing is that it also must mean that tribunals are not authorized to develop the law. There are several tribunals that state as much, but it's kind of obvious. If you are uh, the parties to a dispute, do you pay your arbitral service providers to go on about academic musings about what the law should be? No, you pay them to solve your dispute, not to figure out how they could state the law better. So just, just you know, apply the law as it has decreed and go about your business. So those are fundamental structural problems about your Novit Korea in investor state arbitration. One, even if you applied it, it would be unclear that it would reach the issues in question. And two, there is a significant question as to whether or not you're allowed to do it. Um, whether the um, tribunals have the power to go beyond the pleadings of the parties. Huh. Okay. Wait a minute. That's the problem. Seems pretty easy. Why don't we just say, no, you're a Novit Korea. They just got it wrong. Well, there are significant benefits to Yura Novit Kuria. What do you think those benefits would be that would even be applicable in the context of arbitration? Yeah. Well, uh, uh, if you may say that you probably don't hire someone to decide, you know, to decide your case and apply some you know, brilliant theories of law, but you also want someone to make some, you know, logical and maybe well argumented judgments. So if you have some two parties who are really pleading something really badly, uh -huh. then is the only choice is this the only choice? Like you and then you make a precedent which is based on the poor judgment of one party, and then what? I mean that should not be that might not be always the best case, so you might want someone to upgrade. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the legitimacy of arbitration is at issue every time that you get just a patently bad decision. I mean, in commercial arbitration, nobody really cares, right? I mean, these decisions aren't published. If both parties, even though they have an applicable law clause that says, I don't know, law of Georgia, and both of them, both parties run off and brief this as if the law of England and Wales applied, who cares? Doesn't really matter, right? The parties got what they got. Um, in the context of investor state arbitration, it's a problem because these decisions come out, they're subject to scrutiny. And so you might want to avoid having decisions that are obviously crazy. Now, it, you might think, well, that probably wouldn't happen. I mean, you know, the people who act in investor state disputes, counsel are highly skilled and, might I say, highly paid counsel, mostly from international law firms, they wouldn't make a silly mistake like that of just completely misbriefing the case. Ah. Cue the Argentine financial crisis cases. Um, have any of you, when you looked at bits, heard about these cases that arose out of the Argentine, Argentine financial crisis? There was a slew of them. And it was the foundation of much of sort of what investment law, if there is such a thing, um, is about today. Because there are just so many cases that were decided in such a short period of time. There, there is something, but let me ask, were any of you at, at, at yesterday's lecture? There's, yeah. um, in yesterday's lecture, we discussed public necessity. 
public necessity, meaning that you do not have to compensate somebody for a taking. Could you think about a reason why Argentina, in the context of the worst financial crisis, one of the worst financial crises in its history, would claim public necessity, I don't have to pay? Because they, yeah. I guess because they, uh, by paying, they would depend their own population on the fund, and I guess they argue something about violation of human rights or something, if I can remember correctly. They, they, made every argument in the book to say, I don't have to pay in the context of a financial crisis that led to the uh, fall of several governments in a matter of days, completely debased our currency, had riots on the street. Are you kidding me? I don't have to pay under these circumstances. And one of the reasons that they invoked to say this was, a lot of the claimants were from the United States, the non-precluded measures clause in the United States, Argentina, bilateral investment treaty. Um, which essentially stated that, to the extent necessary, um, essentially incorporated a form of public necessity, um, to the extent necessary, you wouldn't have to abide by the treaty obligations. Um, the problem was that the parties argued about what on earth this clause meant in a very narrow context. One thing that Argentina argued was that this kind of public necessity is self-judging. Argentina and only Argentina could determine whether something constituted necessity. And that a tribunal would have to step aside and allow that self-judgment to stand. Incidentally, Argentina had letters from the United States Department of State that very much backed up its position that, yes, we intended this to be self judgment um, And they further argued about the question whether or not economic circumstances would lead to um, a state that could lead to this kind of public necessity. What they failed to do was something rather obvious, interpret the treaty. None of them provided much of a linguistic parsing of what the terms of that article actually meant. They all just assumed that they were um, meant to incorporate customary international law, namely the International Law Commission's draft article on state responsibility with regard to necessity. Um, pleadings from both sides, in fact, stated as much. Well, here's the problem. An Elma community, uh, committee came along and said, wait a minute, that's just a manifest error of law. You can't apply a treaty without interpreting it. And that sent us racing. Um, incidentally, the tribunals in the Argentine cases, for the most part, stated that this didn't rise to the level of necessity, in part because it wasn't the least restrictive means possible, uh, and in part because, well, um, it didn't meet the requirements of the ILC draft articles otherwise. Um, so, in that instance, one might wonder if the next tribunal that came along was then annulled on that very same basis, because it didn't provide a textual interpretation of the relevant article. In that context, one might very well wonder, should a tribunal not simply have done this ex officio? Here's the language of the treaty, it means this, and it, this is how the parties frame their argument in light of that dispute. Precisely the kind of thing where the parties just, in their enthusiasm to get to the really important point, kind of forgot step one. This had been the law school exam. I think law professors would gleefully have called the student into the office and said, you can't do that. Give me the basics first, step one before step two. Um, so in that instance, would there have been any harm on the part of a tribunal to say, I don't have to ask the parties about their textual interpretation. I know what it's going to be. I'm just going to supply that myself. Probably not. You'd stay within the frame of what the parties pleaded. Nobody would have argued that you do not interpret a treaty. You just apply it. They would all say, yeah, yeah, yeah. You interpret a treaty according to the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. And move on. So this little step would have saved investor state arbitration, one of the biggest nightmares it has ever encountered, namely a slip in legitimacy, because a tribunal 
responding to party pleadings, simply didn't interpret the treaty. It applied the treaty, it implicitly interpreted the treaty, but it didn't do so clearly. It didn't state its clear rationale for how it got from A to B, um, and therefore there was one annulment, well, two annulments, um, and uh, a very strong criticism, uh, somewhat uh, embarrassingly by one of the key drafters of the ILC draft articles on state responsibility, who just stated, ah, that tribunal just got it wrong. Um, so in that instance, Euronovit Curia seems like a very good idea. Um, there was another case where a tribunal implicitly did this, Mobile v. Venezuela, uh, where the issue was a specific article, Article 22, of the Venezuelan Investment Law, which somewhat convolutedly made reference to exit arbitration. And the question was whether this convoluted statement referencing exit arbitration was Venezuela's standing consent to submit to arbitration at exit, or whether it was something altogether different. Um, both parties in Mobile v. Venezuela didn't brief the basis of jurisdiction appropriately, according to me and the Mobile v. Venezuela Tribunal. They briefed it on the basis of essentially law of treaties or Venezuelan domestic law. But they submitted all the authorities that were relevant to determining what this law must be if we're going to have a discussion about a consent instrument, namely a unilateral act of state. So the tribunal, led by the former president of the International Court of Justice, took the authorities submitted by the parties, Gave, gave the decision the opposite legal framework and translated the arguments of the parties, which all worked in the context of unilateral acts, into arguments about unilateral acts and proceeded from there. Is there anything wrong if a tribunal looks to the authorities that the parties submitted and discussed, but for strategic reasons didn't discuss in their own terms, and just say, no, 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 I understand what you're saying. You're saying this, let me just translate this and have a clean legal decision that correctly states what the legal framework is that you're asking me to apply so that I can make sense. You would otherwise have been asked fundamentally to make international nonsense. Um, so in that context, some virtue to your renovate query. Let's again bring this back from the conceptual to the concrete. Tribunals are asked to give reasons for their decisions. Their failure to give reasons for their decisions is similarly a ground for annulling what they have done. If I'm asking you to give me reasons for something, does that mean that I will just pair it back to you what you told me? Is that a reason for my deciding one way or the other? How many of you think that it's enough of a reason if you have, you know, party A says blah, blah. Party B says blee, blee. Therefore, my conclusion. Is that enough to give reasons as to why I reached the conclusion that I did? Whether you should give the reasons. Well, I have an obligation to give reasons. Yeah. Is my recitation of argument enough to give reasons for my decision? No. No. I have to do something beyond just restating what the parties told me in order to independently state my reasons for preferring one over the other. Well, that means by necessity that I have to go beyond the pleadings of the parties in order to give you my reasons for why I think one is right and one's wrong. Well, if by necessity I have to go beyond the pleadings of the party, then I have an obligation to do something that is not there. Well, that sounds awfully like you're an Ovicuria, doesn't it? I have an obligation to go beyond what the parties have pled in order to tell you why I prefer one over the other. So that is fundamentally the problem that you run into with regard to this doctrine of an arbitral jurisprudence. It at the same time looks like it doesn't apply, but at the same time looks like it has to apply. Well, it really just means that we haven't understood what on earth it means in the context of investor state arbitration. It really just means that there is an aporia, uh, to use a Greek term, I, I tire of Latin, I guess, and regress. 
um, of you know, inconsistency that arises out of the practice of master state arbitration that needs some form of resolution. The resolution that I would suggest to you is that in the context of investor state arbitration, Jura Novit Curia refers to the exercise of critical judgment. Okay, I, I told you I'm German. So exercise of critical judgment has a, has a crisp one-worder in German. Urteilskraft. Because we always love to put things together. Um, and there is a humanist understanding of what on earth this Urteilskraft is, namely the ability to discern between competing arguments. It's essentially a um, rhetorical device that you use in order to decide, well, which case was more persuasive. And it functions fundamentally inductively by reference to the facts of the various cases. It functions fundamentally by placing the various interests of the parties into this framework and then deciding, well, I, I will explain to you why I think party A's argument, blah, blah, was better than parties, party B's argument, blee, blee. And it is that these facts make this framework more relevant than the other facts make this framework relevant. So it is that act of comparison that Jura Novis Curia, in that sense, refers to. It refers to the fact that a tribunal obviously must have the power independently to determine the facts. A, power, a, a tribunal has the power independently to determine the facts, and it determines the facts differently from how the parties pled them. It by necessity must apply the legal framework in a different way than the parties have planned it to. And there's no problem with that, because we say that the tribunal has judgment to do that. And if we view Jura Novit Curia, not in the strong sense that a tribunal has the authority to develop law and prescribe, as it does in the context of the ICJ, but merely to carefully exercise its judgment in the context of record facts and record submissions of authorities, we get to a place where we can fundamentally resolve this problem. We can have it both ways and say, look, a tribunal does not go beyond the authorities. It does not independently know lex specialis. It does not independently have an ability to look behind the facts. But at the same time, it is perfectly authorized to fix small problems where these are obviously resolvable within what the parties have argued about. Um, now, that shows you in a way why this is both mandatory and prohibited depending on how you view you run with Victoria. And it gives you a much stronger framework for understanding what it is that tribunals actually do in the day-to-day -day resolution of investor state disputes. Um, and so it's the basis for where I go from there in my book by comparing the judgment exercised by investor state tribunals to the judgment exercised by common law courts. So that's I would like to stop. If you have any questions, I'd love to take your questions. Yeah. Uh, so you've mentioned this uh, exercise of critical judgment, mm. which sounds fine. Uh, the question is, like, uh, so that sort of a rationale which says that the tribunal or the decision maker should stay within the legal framework. That's what you're saying. Mm -hmm. uh, and you cannot go beyond that, right? I mean, you choose one of the parties putting over another, but you give your own reasons. Mm -hmm. However, you stay within the legal framework and you don't go beyond it. The so-called no surprise rule. You don't write there something that might come out of blue. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're saying? Well, or it, no? the problem is that there is a surprise. I can promise you that when counsel for Mobile and counsel for Venezuela got said decision, both of them burst out saying, Freddie was right, how did that happen? No. Um, it, it, they were both surprised. They didn't expect that decision to come out of their pleadings. Um, if you look at the recitation of the argument, if you look at the way that the tribunal analyzed what happened, they would seriously have said, where did they get that from? We never, plead, we never pled this, we never said any of this. They argued about it and they submitted the authorities 
on the basis of which the tribunal could come to its conclusion. But this is a fair surprise, not an unfair surprise. So what I'm saying is, well, you, fair surprise is OK, because fair surprise requires you to engage what the parties themselves have submitted and argued about. Now, if the parties have just have submitted this and not really paid attention, it would be a different story, because just, OK, you put a document in and somebody made something of it. That's not enough. You have to actually make it part of what the argument is about, just for very strategic reasons, say, no, I, really, I don't trust that way to go. I mean, parties in litigation frequently want to avoid the elephant in the room because they don't know which way it's going to sway. So they don't know who is going to benefit from that unknown quantity. So they're much happier to stay with what they know to be a safe argument for them, even though it's not really the opposite argument. And that's, I think, where you have this problem um, there is a surprise, but it's a fair surprise because the parties submitted this. Now, if the parties hadn't submitted on this issue, I would, I would say that the tribunal was not going to be authorized to make this determination. It would have to go back to the parties and say, guys, uh, please, could you uh, plead the relevant case law for me? Direct them and ask leading questions. Or yeah. Now, if the parties, again, refuse to do that, they're in a bit of a pickle. Um, you have to then decide the dispute you got. You can't say, well, I've asked the question, now that I've asked the question, it's part of the frame of the case. You have to actually get meaningful engagement by the parties on the relevant framework. But so it's not a no surprise rule. There is, there is a real surprise. It's just that the surprise is fair rather than unfair because it's part of what you'd expect a tribunal to do when it approaches a record and not something you would not expect them to do, namely make up new records. It's an expected surprise. I mean, any time you have, and that's why I think most people in, in arbitration would do very well, well any uh, contentious proceeding, would do very well to settle their cases. It, you really don't know what's going to come out at the other end. Um, and not necessarily to say that what comes out at the other end is bad, just to say that what comes out at the other end, you know, you're giving it to three people of a very different point of view from you, um, and that are asked to resolve this particular question. You don't know which way they're going to jump. You hope you do. But you really, you know, take your life in your own hands. Kind of like crossing the road in Tbilisi yet. <laughs> um, yeah. Any, any more questions? Yeah. Yeah. Well, some BRAs include so-called execo and bond law provisions. Can the maximum of Uranovit Kui and Fran from this principle? Well, if, if, if the parties authorize the tribunal to decide the dispute equitably, then that's fine. They don't, they're, they're no longer bound by law. They're, they're, they're bound by principles of fairness. So in, in that context, one would presume that the tribunal knows fairness, because otherwise you wouldn't have chosen those three members. But there, there's really no surprise that's possible. Um, so no, in that, in that context, um, the problem doesn't arise. Yes? Question. Uh, you that question may sound silly because I, I walked into the lecture quite late. But I just want to uh, clear some things for myself. Yeah. Um, so in general, when you have a, uh, a tribunal that is hearing a dispute, uh, looking into the nature of the dispute, you have to make a decision. Probably you might. But the tribunal has mm -hmm. to make a decision about the facts because facts can be disputed. Yep. And also the law. So yep. if there is any misunderstanding between the parties about the facts or the law, then there is a dispute. So obviously, the, the tribunal or whoever is the uh, uh, dispute, dispute the resolving body has these powers. Right? So we agree that uh, kind of looking into the facts and determining what were the actual facts is in the power of the dispute system. So long, the, the, the tribunal has the power to determine the facts on the basis of the record that the parties have assembled. Yes. So it, it, the tribunal could not go on Google and start yes. researching and deliberations. Obviously. Obviously. And, and you are not going to start concerned with facts. It concerns, it's concerned with the law. Mm -hmm. So when, when it comes to the law, then you start with the scope of the dispute. So first is the determination of the claims. So as you said, if the court or the dispute settlement body is crazy enough to 
actually determined by itself and not include the actual submissions of the parties, then that is the ground for annulling the agreement, right? So that also goes outside of the scope of the UNO. Then you actually have two things remaining. One is determining what the law is and then interpreting. Mm -hmm. When it comes to determining what the law is, it actually boils down to a very simple uh, job of selecting the sources of it, right? So well, who does the selecting? What law you have to apply. So there you have two choices. One is the law that has been presented by the parties, mm -hmm. or you can yourself, the, the, the tribunal, tribunal itself can determine whether that law which the parties split is enough, or should I seek something else? For example, in, in, in public international law, there can be uh, the, the, the ICJ, when, when, when actually you refer to Article 38 and the list of sources, then you have treaties, custom, general principles of law, and, and also subsidiary means for determining the Now, it actually is logical that the, that the tribunal of the dispute settlement body, so general, has power, should have the power, to determine what were the rules which actually at some point in time the states, each of the parties to the dispute, said that they were bound by it, right? So they expect, they, they expressed in, 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 in some kind of form their consent to be bound by these rules, right? So that seems logical that even if either of the parties fail to name a source, the tribunal should be equipped with the power to actually identify such, such a source of law, which is applicable to both sides, by a simple test that they actually at some point said that we are bound by this. And the second job, once, once, once the court does that for the tribunal, then it has to interpret it. So now what I don't understand is this new and with Korea principle, I mean, where, where does it put the threshold? Does it put the threshold in terms of selecting the sources? Or, or even end or, uh, interpreting the law uh, uh, once it identifies what the law is. So, where, where is the problem? Yes. In both? In, 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 in both. Selecting the law and then interpreting the law? Correct. In both. Um, so, let me give you another example that relates to the U.S.-Argentina bit in the Non-Precluded Measures Clause. So, um, the CMS Annulment Committee noted that the Bilateral Investment Treaty constituted lex specialis and therefore um, did not refer to and could not apply the ILC draft articles on state responsibility on necessity. The SEMPRA Annulment Committee annulled on that basis in a similar case. Um, so now we have a question as to whether or not the treaty is integrated by reference to customary international law or not. Now, let's add another layer of difficulty. The Continental Casualty Tribunal noted that the uh, provision in question looked very much like the WTO GATT exceptions provision and therefore applied the test of the WTO GATT provision and thus applied a different treaty and said, no, it integrates a different direction. Um, my submission is that a tribunal is not authorized to select the source of law without party aid and not authorized to interpret the source without party aid. Now, the party aid does not have to come strictly in the pleadings. It doesn't have, the pleadings don't have to say the right words and you just pick by means of baseball well, arbitration. Let, 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 let's skip the interpretation part because yep. that, that is kind of a separate issue this for me. So in terms of selecting the sources, now you are saying that the, the, the legal issue at hand that needs to be resolved can be as such that the tribunal can actually apply several provisions from various sources. Mm -hmm. But what actually, according to this principle, what actually it has to do because otherwise, if it does not do it, then it will be ground for annulment, right? Or, or would it not be a ground for annulment? The failure on the part of a tribunal to apply the quote-unquote correct law, so long as it's premised in the party's pleadings, yes. is fine. Okay, so the ultimate, the exhaustive list of sources, would it be fair to say 
exhaustive list of legal sources for the dispute settlement body is the sources cited by both parties, either, of, either that side or that side. So it cannot come up with any source whatsoever and say, well, which, is, which is not put in by either party, and it cannot use it, because then it would just be deviation to that extent that it would then question the legitimacy. It, the with, with one caveat, yes. And the caveat is that the parties don't have to plead the sources. They just have to submit yeah, the source. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, pleading is the, the, the... Yes, I, I do understand. I apologize for, for uh, but yeah. this use of this word. But, so but they yeah. have to use it. So they have to make reference somewhere. Right? So in the pool of material that is submitted before the dispute settlement body, you find that source somewhere that you can use it. If you cannot find it, then you cannot use it. Right. And you can only use it as an additional hurdle if the arguments the parties made can be translated into the language that is relevant to that source. They argued about the correct issues. They just so happened to use the wrong terminology. Sorry. So then we go into the, into the interpretation, which is actually linked to, 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 to in a sense, uh, in, uh, to the question of determination of what the rule should be. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to the interpretation, as you said, that it is not the right of the court, but rather no, an obligation to come up with its own critical arguments, because it has to prove to the sides why does it accept the arguments of one side and why does it dismiss the arguments of the other side. Yep. Right? So, so it has to interpret, it, it has to, as you said, you put it in more beautiful words, so I will try to rephrase it. Uh, in my own way. So basically what the dispute settlement body has to do is select the arguments which have been presented and then come up with a some kind a kind of come up with an explanation, but not an interpretation, but rather an explanation. Why is it selecting an interpretation of either of the parties mm -hmm. and using it as an argument for its decision. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that people are just making their life complicated because it, in a sense, is still an application of the law. Because when, when parties put their case and they present their arguments, they obviously see that this rule shall be read that way and shall be used that way. So for, for this particular body to limit itself by these, not, not the literal phrases and usage of words, but the essence that is kind of read by the parties, that is the limitation of, of, uh, of the tribunal. So let, let, me, let me put it to you very boldly. It seems to me that this game, rules of the games, are created by the lawyers because then actually it is the competition of the lawyers of the two sides. Whoever is the stronger, they don't care about the tribunal as such. But the lawyer who has the stronger arguments and then gets this better understanding, you know, that then he can defeat the other side without actually having a, a risk of smart guys at the tribunal coming up with counter-arguments of that side to defeat this. So. That, that's about right. Um, it, 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 and yes, in the end, what you plead matters. Uh, what the supposition behind it all is, is that the law in this area, at least, if not international law in general, it's fundamentally indeterminate. There is, and if you say, well, you have to apply the law, well, what is the law? It assumes that there is some sort of ontological being out there that is the law that you could discover and apply. And I very much doubt that that's the case. The law as it stands right now in all of these cases is being progressively developed just by sheer necessity. The fact that you have so few cases out there suggests that tribunals are treading on new ground. Given that tribunals are treading on new ground and are developing rules that you couldn't discover, they have to progress very carefully whenever they think that they're smarter than the parties. Because let me promise you something, they're never smarter than the parties for a very simple reason. They don't know all the facts. There are facts that the parties don't plead 
that would be relevant to whatever the tribunal thinks is the right thing to do. But you know, the parties don't put them in because neither, nobody's argued about that. So for a, for a tribunal to arrogate to itself the power to be smarter than the lawyers creates significant issues because there are more facts that the parties legitimately would want to submit and say, no, 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 no. Nice thought, yes. Had you only asked us, we would have supplied you with the following, you know, 100 pages of additional materials that you could have easily looked through and you would have noticed that your clever thought was wrong. Um, and that's, I think, the real problem. That if tribunals go outside of what the parties plead on the assumption that there is such a thing as the law, they're stepping into a void. There's only law to the extent that the parties have pled in this context. You're talking about the social community. If somebody else has a question, I will just shout. If somebody else has a question, then I will just walk. Because I have You're suggesting an academic approach, which will, which will, which will be applicable to all kinds of situations, and even hypothetical ones. So you are suggesting the limited application of the Uran in the case of investment international investment arbitration. What happens uh, if we take a hypothetical situation when one party, some state, some banana republicans, have enough money to hire a very experienced lawyer, and the lawyer is can a uh, point of authority or law applicable to this case? In this case, the Uran of Korea should be applicable to arbitration and full extent in this hypothetical you're in a very uncomfortable position in that case that um, you know you're in the Korea in the context of um, various ICJ cases was applied because the respondent didn't show um, so in an investor state context you have to look at you know the various rules that deal with a no-show my general inclination is that if a country doesn't seem to care about the fact that it's getting sued for a significant portion of its GDP, it takes its life in its own hands. Um, it, it, nobody uh, bats an eyelash if people default on significant civil claims. Why should it be any different if a country defaults? So I would, I would say no. In that case, the tribunal should stick within what the parties have submitted. They may ask pointed questions from time to time, but if there's no satisfactory response, they're stuck with what they're stuck with. Is there any difference of the application of this principle in commercial arbitration and investment arbitration? Because I have a background in commercial arbitration, so often we are, we are using this principle of your knowledge because parties are sometimes uh, not uh, pointing uh, the law. Yeah, they're, they're, it's different. It's different simply because commercial arbitration is fundamentally rooted in the law of the seat of the arbitration. Would say, no, I'm, I, I do what the parties tell me to do. Swiss Arbitration Act very much says there is. And even expressly in, well, um, doctrine would strongly suggest that Jura Novit Korea is in that sense an express exception from the principle of contradictoire that would even be applicable in the context of civil procedure. So depending upon which country you're in, Jura uh, Novit Korea may very well be applicable to you or may not. Um, thus, choose the seat of arbitration very wisely. You may get more than you bargained for. But again, it, if you don't hire counsel that affords you with the advice that tells you, well, this is the kind of risk you run into, I have very little sympathy. I, I guess I give away that I practiced in a big law firm for a long time. Um, but I, I really think that these are the kind of decisions where you assume risk. And the risk that you assume uh, has a price. And if it's priced in, you shouldn't get double compensated for it by saying, well, I got this concession from you somewhere else, but now that I realize that I'm at the wrong end of it, I'm running to the court to help me. Um, so in that case, I would say, yeah, if, if, it's in your, if it's in your law, it's in your law, great. If it's not in your law, don't apply. Yeah. Um, in terms of the sources on which the tribunal may base its decision. 
and the sources are as invoked by the parties. But if the tribunal wants to rely on a source which was not invoked by a party, couldn't it just go back to the parties and say, hey, this is something that I want to consider, mm -hmm. so what do you think about it? And then the tribunal gets the feedback of the parties, so as long as you know there, there are these pleadings, not initially, but even invited by the tribunal, then there is... Uh, Within you reason. have the position of the parties. I yes. think the guiding thing is to have hear both parties on even something they did not initially submit, and that tribunal of its own knowledge and expertise knew. So as long as you go back to the parties and get their that is, I, I would within reason that's okay. Within reason, that's what the tribunal should do. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't get the answer at once, it's still stuck with what it has. The problem has come up once, that an arbitrator has essentially kept asking about more and more cases that all were very one-sided and whoops, decided the case on the basis of one of the cases he himself asked about. Yeah. No. That led to an annul. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't mean to suggest that this arbitrator was in any way doing anything other than what he really sincerely thought was his obligation. I really think he... He did the right thing from his perspective. He just sort of, at some point, there is a line, and an annulment committee may very well ding you for it. So if you ask once, and you don't get the answer you want, and you ask again, and then you ask again, it, you can't coach the parties into a corner. Um, so yes, within reason, that's what tribunals should do. They should have a dialogue with the parties. What this means is tribunals engage the record. They engage the parties. You don't have a tribunal that considers itself above the parties and that it is authorized by I don't know whom to make decisions out of thin air because somebody anointed them king of the world. There are some arbitral tribunals in investor state arbitration that are getting dangerously close to doing just that. And um, there are brave annulment committees that from time to time smack them back down. But not always. So I think it's a really important area to clarify what the practice of the wealth of investor state arbitration has been so far, both to enlighten what the practice should be and you know, prevent abuses. Because to the extent there is an abuse, it can cost a company or it can cost a country, depending on which side of the debate the, 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 you know, the, the error is made. So that's really what I'm trying to get at. That yes, you, of course, ask and engage. But one, don't ever take it away from the parties. And two, don't sneakily take it away from the parties where they I said, well, they asked. When what was really obviously the case was the opposite. They were just steering the dispute in the, direct, in the corner they wanted it in to then say, well, I have done everything I was supposed to do. I don't know what they're complaining about. It. Everything's quite proper. Um, my impression of arbitrators. But I mean, th that's really what it boils down to that, yeah, engage, yes, not engage. That's valid I, you know, for commercial arbitration as well. I mean, even in commercial arbitration, there's a very thin to what extent can an arbitrator go and invent something? It, it, I mean, would, it would depend on the jurisdiction that you're in. It, um, I mean, there's some jurisdictions which treat arbitrators essentially. Mm -hmm as quasi-judges that are de have delegated authority of the courts, essentially, and as such have quasi-inquisitorial powers. If you have an arbitrator who can act like that, there's really no complaint about an arbitrator doing that. I would highly recommend parties not choose that jurisdiction as a seat for arbitration. As you know, a practitioner of arbitration, I would say that's nuts. You never want to cede that much control to anybody about your dispute. The point of arbitration is that you don't. But if somebody happened to have done that, you know, better luck next time. And most arbitrators wouldn't do it. Most arbitrators know that, look, their reappointment depends upon the fact that the parties are generally happy with how they ran the proceedings. Somebody who, you know, says, I don't care about any of you guys. I'm going to lunch and then I'm going to decide this case and I don't care what you say. I'm just going to do it. Is never going to get another point because um, it's a small field. Um, so you're right, I think, that as a matter of practicality, they'd be authorized. Some jurisdictions would say, yeah, 
go right ahead, decide the dispute on an inquisitorial basis, determine the law fully independently, and there's nothing wrong with that. No set aside, um, no danger of non-enforcement. Scary thought, but it's out there. Any more questions? Yes? Well, can we just zoom out the stuff here? Uh, the major problem is the interpretation. Mm -hmm. If one party has a lawyer who, who uses a textual interpretation of the rule, and the other party who has a lawyer and use that interpretation with respect to the object and the purpose of the rule, mm -hmm. and suddenly the tribunal comes out with a textual approach, then the textualist party will win, obviously. So I think that the major problem here is the interpretation and the principle basically should have limitations. Uh, and what do you suggest uh, for a tribunal? Like what kind of like limitations to the principle would be necessary in order to avoid the chaos in the judgment? Well, I mean, one thing is that you'd be well advised to respond to the pleadings of your opponent. Um, there's a famous case in the United States um, involving Texaco, in which Texaco decided that it was going to win the case on liability and was simply not going to put in a damages expert. The only figure on damages that was available was plaintiff's damages figure and Texaco in background. Um, so contest. If you make the litigation choice not to contest, you run the risk that you know, the interpretation will go against you. I think to some degree, if a party has said, here's my textual interpretation interpreted textually, it would have no grounds to complain if the textual interpretation went against it, so long as it was a plausible textual interpretation that was within the scope of what the parties were arguing about. If it's the provision the parties were arguing about that, rather than something completely different, then you would have engaged and exercised the independent judgment that you're supposed to exercise. But, I mean, the problem with textual interpretation is that you don't, it's not always obvious. So if a party thinks that it doesn't need to submit on the text and just wants to submit on an object and purpose or context, uh, those things regularly backfire. Uh, and nobody complains, that they, nobody would even notice that that happened. So the, the award comes out, people read it and think it's a fine award. And the council are jumping up and down and telling their buddies, saying, you won't believe what just happened. And then they're like, well, why didn't you brief that? Um, so I mean, that's kind of the problem, that it's, a, it, it's an engagement that goes really th in three different directions. It goes you know, between the parties and the tribunal. It goes between. Um, the, the, the parties, you know, the various parties of the tribunal and between the parties themselves. So if you, if you fail to educate the tribunal, you know, you're stuck with the result you get. I know it's not a very comforting thought, but I mean, the problem is if you had a tribunal come up with its own approach to everything, that would lead to even more arbitrary results and would lead to a decision that simply doesn't have legitimacy in what went on. The biggest complaint that I hear from counsel and parties about cases they lost is that decision looks nothing like the case we argue. It has nothing to do with what we spend $12 million litigating. If you spend $12 million litigating a case, and that's actually not that bizarre figure in these cases, the tribunal should pay you the courtesy of paying attention to what you say. Uh, I mean, that's sort of, you know, again, somewhat more of a discomforting um, answer, but I think in the end it is more responsive to what the parties themselves put in. You can't expect to get something else out than what you yourself have engaged into it. And you know, some people are going to have the worst of it, but you know, in the end they only have themselves to blame. Again, I've spoken like a true big firm lawyer. <laughs> I'm keeping you from coughing. I'm trying to understand the reasons why these restrictions exist. So these restrictions exist only when or with respect to the disputes that involve the state. 
Investor state yes. disputes. So the dispute has to be more the state. So the, the most logical reason why these restrictions could exist to me is uh, uh, because if, you, if the economist does not obey that restrictions, then there is a big chance to infringe upon the sovereignty of the state. By what I mean is that if the tribunal assumes an authority to determine the source of laws and come up with a new interpretation, then it runs into the risk to identify the rule about which the state actually has not expressed its consent to be bound. So if it does that, then it means that it's taking the portion of the sovereignty from the state which the state did not willingly give up, which is absolutely in contradiction with the, the idea of international law. Right? It, it also works with regard to the investor. I mean, if the investor didn't consent, then um, it similarly would deprive the investor of the right to participate in these proceedings. I think what it boils down to is really a, that investor state arbitration is a public international form of dispute resolution. And there was a compromise generally with regard to public international law arbitration which suggests a limited approach to jurisdiction, but a limited approach that isn't restricted. So essentially, you require consent with regard to a dispute, but you don't put the thumbs on the scale against finding the consent. The thumb that you put on the scale is fundamentally to say that you can only act within that limited scope. You don't have, in arbitration, the authority of um, a court. And uh, so somebody who sort of mused upon that when it came to the role of supervisory jurisdiction in international law was Michael Reisman, um, uh, who was over at Yale. He said, look, an arbitrator, public international law arbitrator, not investor state, would exceed his powers if he started to go beyond this compromise. Because the compromise means you don't have a court of general jurisdiction that automatically hears all these cases. You have tribunals of limited jurisdiction that must respond to the parties. And that very much limits the powers of arbitral tribunals as compared to courts. Uh, and that's something that you know, reflected in the problem. Coffee? Anyone? Anyone? Coffee. <laughs>